a budget, anyone's budget, Congress's budget, is a statement of our values. This budget is a one-sided budget. We've just finished a conference, and that is a term of art that I don't understand, I guess. There has never been any input from the chairman of um, the ranking member of our committee. Uh, there's been no input from anyone but the Republicans. They met with themselves in secret. There was no public debate at all on this terrible budget that they have given to the American public. If the American public knew what was in that budget, they would revolt. As one member said in the caucus today, if this were given to the American public, you couldn't get 10 percent of the American public who would agree with the budget that they've done. So um, when conferences used to be conferences, you had an open debate, and it was a conference. You met together and had a public debate on what happened, but this is not the case with this budget of theirs. So um, I believe that they should have let us help. They would have done better with our help. But they made the decision this was going to be their budget, their budget only, and it's their values, none of ours. Senator Durbin. Thanks, Senator Reid. Uh, they say when it comes to a budget, the devil's in the details. Let's look at the details. The Republican budget repeals health care reform, cutting off affordable care to 27 million people who otherwise would have, uh, would have otherwise been insured over the next decade. That means that they're also telling young people who need their parents' insurance that they're on their own. People with pre-existing conditions no longer protected. It includes a $1.2 trillion cut impacting Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. It cuts income security programs by $660 billion, including food stamps, the SNAP program, school lunch, and other nutrition programs, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, and unemployment insurance, to name a few. It allows huge corporations to continue to exploit the tax code and avoid paying nearly $100 billion annually in taxes. It favors big banks by deregulating Wall Street and putting taxpayers back at risk. It refuses to invest in our country because it scales back on education and freezes Pell Grants. This is just a snapshot of the Republican budget. You want to know why they wrote it behind closed doors? When you hear the details, you can understand it. This is like Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor, giving to the rich. It hurts far too many people working families, middle-income families, seniors, women, and children. As we move closer uh, to seeing this conference committee coming out on the budget, I hope the Republicans can find it on themselves to come to the table and actually work with us to put something together that might be good for the benefit of this country. Senator Schumer. Thank you. Well, during the conference between the House and Senate, our Republicans' colleagues had to settle their internal differences over just how extreme the budget should be. But now that they have, mostly, there are still some Republicans left with the old school integrity. You know, when they were in charge, we had to balance everything, balance, balance. Now, of course, that they're in charge, that's out the window. Do anything you want to get defense raised, even if it's spending more money. But overall, they've settled a lot of their differences, uh, even though Senator Corker and others aren't yet going along with the report, because they still are st singing the old school Tim, yeah, him. But Republicans are going to now have to figure out a way, even if they come to an agreement, how to convince the American people that slashing funding for student loan repayment, making college less affordable, is going to help the middle class. They're going to have to explain to the middle class why they're cutting public safety funding, cancer research, infrastructure, other job-creating investments. They're going to have to convince the American people repealing Obamacare yet again is a good idea, and putting insurance companies back in charge of health insurance is a good idea, even though Obamacare has slashed the growth in health care costs. It's a tough case to make, and we're putting them on notice. Republicans are going to have to do all these things on their own. Republicans should be warned right here, right now. Democrats are not going to help you pass appropriations bills that lock in senseless, automatically triggered cuts that hurt the middle class. Instead, 
will be eager to work with our Republican colleagues to prevent those cuts from taking effect and restoring both defense spending and vital middle class funding in an even way. One dollar for defense, one dollar for the middle class. Democrats know that for America to be great, we need both a strong middle military abroad and a strong middle class here at home. So Republicans will have a choice. They can double down on their extreme budget and underfund the middle class if they insist on using budget gimmicks as they have now to fund defense and showering millionaires with more tax cuts while, hurt, while hurting working families, they'll find Democrats standing shoulder to shoulder, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, to stop them. But instead, if Republicans reach out to Democrats to work to prevent in a balanced way these cuts from harming our economy, they'll find an outstretched hand. We'll see what the appropriators will do. Are they going to try to enact this budget? Let them try. They won't even get most of the Republicans to vote for it. Republicans have mapped out a budget, but they should be absolutely clear their map won't lead them anywhere. Democrats are eager and willing to fund both middle class and defense programs. We urge our Republican colleagues to work with us and achieve this goal. Last year's chair of the Budget Committee, Senator Patty Murray. Middle class families across our country want Congress to work together towards a government that works for all of our families, not just the wealthiest few. They want us to be focusing on policies that grow the economy from the middle out, not from the top down. And they certainly do not want us to go back to the bad old days of constant crises and budget brinksmanship. So it is very disappointing that instead of working with us to build on our bipartisan budget deal, instead of working with us to create jobs and boost wages and increase economic security for all of our families, it sounds like Republicans are preparing to push for another vote on just another warmed over, trickle down, partisan budget. Instead of taking a balanced and bipartisan approach, Republicans would be pushing us towards a government that works for the wealthy, and well-connected, but leaves our seniors and our middle class and our working families behind. The Republican budget would lock in the automatic cuts from sequestration, cuts that most Republicans agree are not sustainable and not realistic. We know the sequester caps are terrible policy. The President has said he will veto any spending bills at the sequester levels. But instead of fixing this problem, Republicans seem intent on papering it over with a gimmick. Their budget wouldn't actually increase the caps on defense or non-defense spending. It just allows them to pretend they have more to spend on defense while kicking the can down the road and not actually addressing the issue. So it is no surprise Republicans seem to be having trouble getting this budget conference back to the floor for a vote. There's no need by the way, for this to be last minute. We can get this done now. Allow the Appropriations Committee to actually do the work they need to do and not wait for another budget crisis to force us back to the table. We know that Republicans control Congress. It is their job to write and pass the budget, but our door is open. Democrats want to work with them to build on the bipartisan budget deal, and I truly hope that they will take us up on that before we start running into another needless crisis. I think the Justice Department improvement is going to take place, and I'm going to give a speech later today on the floor about the Baltimore situation. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed. Um, President Obama said that Democrats are being dishonest and actually misleading people on trade, and mm -hmm. they tell no vote on that. Do you think that's going to be the case? Well, I think that's Hell no, I have no answer. Okay. Mr. Reed. Yeah. Today, the National Football League indicated in a letter to Paul Ryan that this year it was declining its tax exempt status, so it's no longer a tax exempt organization. Yeah. Do you have a reaction? Um, that indicates the money that the National Football League is making. Uh, that tax uh, break that they got is $100 million. They're treating that as if it's nothing because they have such problems uh, with other issues, not the least of which is. Um, cow towing to the owners, especially one that has a team here in Washington. 
Uh, state of California just last week outlawed the using of the name Redskins. There are a couple teams out there that used it. That's no longer available to them in California. Uh, we know that they have an ongoing crisis with the head injuries. So the National Football League has a lot more problems than uh, the subsidy that they get from taxpayers. Yes, sir. Does it mean what? All I know is that my caucus feels very strongly that the middle class is being treated unfairly and that if there is going to be an increase in the military, which I have no doubt they deserve and need it, so does the middle class deserve and need. But the domestic discretionary spending is being has plummeted for a number of years now and it has to stop plummeting. Sorry, sorry. May I ask a question, Senator Schumer, please? Of course. Senator Schumer, Senator Schumer uh, you know, I think it's okay. <laughs> He's the leader. It's okay. There's been a, a, Washington Post, CNN has covered the story of Charles Gladden, a 63-year-old homeless guy working in the Senate restaurant. Uh, there's a letter by some senators, including Senator Durbin, calling for a, a livable a wage to be paid in the restaurant. Is that something you support? Yes. And as former, as former member of the uh, Chairman of the Rules Committee, was it a mistake to privatize the Senate restaurant? Well, I'm not going to go into what happened. It happened before I was Rules Chair, but we do support a living wage. Uh, for all of the restaurant workers. We've made that clear to the chairman of the Rules Committee, and we hope we can work something out to get that done. Do you think $15 an hour is And, and I, yes. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chuck. Yes, I do think $15. I, I think if you look at the statistics of what, how these men and women are treated, it's really quite stark. 23% of the people we have um, serving us food are on uh, welfare, food stamps. I'm, as I indicated, I've spent a lot of time with my staff today. This is a major issue as far as I'm concerned, I think, the American people. And I'm going to give a speech that it, where we've worked on already today, sometime before we go out today, on that issue. Senator, Last progress? question, yes, what? Are you making progress with uh, McConnell on the amended process on the Well, I hope so. I've asked uh, that um, Senator Corker and Cardin sit down and talk to him as soon as possible, and I know they're trying to do that. So. I would hope that uh, we have a way of going forward on this. This legislation is critically important to our country and to the world, and we need to do everything we can to preserve it in the way it came out of that committee, 19 to nothing. Thanks.